Pastor. Hi. Hey, coach. Hello. 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 Update on my nephew, Pastor. He's uh they still they still got him on the holding pattern. Okay. Yeah, and the kids, the kids is you know, they had their they they had their days when they kind of get traumatized, but everything's well. I'm good. Good uh, evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good uh, evening, Sister Joan. Good evening. Hey. Good evening, Pastor. Good evening. How you doing? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm trying to get situated over here. I think I'm good now. Good Sorry. evening, everybody. Hey. Hi, First Lady. Good hey, evening. Sister Betty. I'm trying to get on my computer. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Sister Caldwell. Sister Caldwell. <laughs> Carrie. Sister Trotter. Hey, Kathy. Hey, Sister Trotter. Let's see if ready to get this one. Hello, everyone. Hey, Sister oh, Kathy. Right How you doing? I'm great in yourself. I'm doing well. Good. Good evening, Pastor. Are you doing good today? Yeah, I'm doing good. Just trying to get all this stuff going. Uh, yeah, I'm doing well. <laughs> hey, Kathy. Hey, Betty. <laughs> Say it again. I'm going to do my computer audio. Okay, it's working out. <laughs> okay. You sure? Okay, let me get my. There we go. Hey, Sister Pitts. Good evening. Yes, sir. I was going to say it's off. Sorry, I have a little conversation over here with my wife. <laughs> hey, Sister Patrice. <laughs> All right, 601, we're going to start rolling. I just heard one of my friends say you start on time, you end on time. So we hope, hopefully, hope to do that. Uh, had all kind of stuff. Just uh, want to remind us to continue to be in prayer for uh, some people, uh, continue to keep uh, Sister Gayla McGee lifted up in prayer and her sister, I think her na sister's name is Tresha, Tresha, something like that, yeah, but keep her sister lift, lifted up. That funeral will be um, March the 28th. It's next Thursday, week from tomorrow. It'll be at Serenity. And uh, the visitation will be from 11, uh, excuse me, from 10 to 11, and then the service will be at 11. So it's going to be a double funeral for uh, her son and her nephew. So, um, but that's, those are the plans that they have now. They've got several preachers in their family. And so I know Marvin Clay, some of you guys from Grace know Marvin Clay. And so uh, he's going to be doing, he's in parts, part of the, uh, doing part of the eulogy. And I'm not sure, I forgot who she said the other minister was. And so, uh, but we just, I talked to her, to, well, text with her today. So she's hanging in there. So she asked that we continue to keep her lifted up in prayer. Uh, also, uh, remember Keisha Harris, as we uh, just uh, laid to rest her husband over the weekend. And so keep keep that family lifted up. And then I heard Jeff Fleming today had another, he lost another relative. 
Um, so be mindful of that in your prayers. A uh, young man by the name of Michael Heights had lost his father. And uh, so we want to continue to pray for him. And then Juanita McGill, I heard, lost a uh, a family member as well, a relative as well. So hmm. want to keep uh, those people lifted up in prayer as well as yourself. Uh, let's see. I see some other folk have joined in. Sister Patrice, uh, Sister Sue uh, Marchbanks, good evening. Tony Yerby, good evening to you. Mike, good evening, my brother. And... Uh, Sister Hall, she has joined in with us. And let me go over here to the Facebook. Uh, see who I have. Linda Smith has come in on Facebook. Say good evening to her. Carrie Bikes and Erica Cox uh, are with us on Facebook. Patrice Crawford. Beatrice, I'm sorry. Beatrice Crawford is on Facebook. Octavia Carr is on Facebook. Uh, both of them say good evening all. all. See, Patrice, Sister B says good evening all. Uh, Sister Carr says good evening family. Juanita McGill says good evening pastor and Sister Betty and everyone. Linda Smith likewise says good evening family. Uh, the preacher up in Topeka, Brother Newton, Pastor Newton, he mm -hmm. says, uh, he says, Dr. McNeil, but mm -hmm. uh, that's that's okay. <laughs> I don't feel like a doctor. Sister Phaedra Lee has joined in. She says, good evening, along with D.L. Lee, uh, Erica Cox, good evening, everyone. DeHadra Crossdale Hines says, good evening, everyone. And uh, with Pastor Newton, he says, also Pastor Sam Ward. Uh, Brother Mario White has joined in. He says, evening to the saints, all right? Going, coming back to uh, Zoom, see uh, Lady B has joined with us, so I'll say good evening. I'll be going back and forth for a while <laughs> until I get everybody, but uh, uh, Sister Frazier, Lady B has joined in with us. Uh, Marcia, i wait. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was waiting for his audio to get connected. Yeah, I want people's audio be connected so, I, so they can hear me say hello. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, Sister Berries, I, I think I said Sister Hall when I did. Mike, good evening. I'm waiting for Derek to come in so I can say hello to him, but I don't see his audio is still trying to get connected. Okay, so we'll get rolling here in a minute. <laughs> I feel a certain kind of way. I said, man, it's light outside, ain't dark no more. I said, um, weather's getting better. Going back to the house, man. I'm like, ooh, should we or should we not? So I'm gonna play that by ear. May pick a pick a Wednesday and and uh, open it up and mm -hmm. and test the waters. And don't y'all get scared now, because I know y'all comfortable. I know y'all comfortable, because so am I. Look, look, I ain't gonna lie, I'm comfortable too, man. So I was, the reason why I thought of that <laughs> we were talking to a minister friend. Uh, uh, just before, a little bit before we came on, 20, 30 minutes before we came on. And so we said, what y'all doing? Where y'all at? You could tell they were out. And they said, you know, they drive, they on their way to the church, to the church building. I said, oh, okay. To Bible study. Yeah, on their way to Bible study. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, kind of made me feel a certain kind of way. But nevertheless, we're going to praise God for what we have and uh, and approach our Bible study in that way. Tracy Reeves come in on Facebook and brother Derek, good evening to you, my brother. All right, let me see. Make sure I got everybody. All right. Confirm my speaking language. No, because it said Arabic or something like that. So, all right, let's open up with a word of prayer. And again, remember those people that we listed it at the beginning. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we humbly bow before your presence and we're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, and we're thankful in this season, Lord, we're reminded, uh, Lord, of the power of the resurrection and the meaning of the resurrection. Lord, like Paul said, Lord, if it hadn't hadn't been for the resurrection, Lord, we would still be in our sins. And mm -hmm. so in this season, Lord, we celebrate that mm -hmm. uh, it's because he was risen on the third day, Lord, that we can have hope in this life and we can have hope beyond the grave, Lord. And so as we meditate in our word, Lord, as we read the scriptures, Lord, we pray your word will refresh, refresh us, rebuild us, and strengthen us, Lord, as we go through this life down here on this earth, Lord, knowing, Lord, that there's a better 
life that you have ahead for us, eternal life, Lord. And we're grateful again for that. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit, yeah. third person of the Trinity, uh, Lord, that abides in us, Lord, that comforts us, that directs us, that guides us, Lord. So we're thankful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we just thank you for your love for us, that you sent your son to die on a cross, Lord. Thank you for these 66 books. Mm -hmm. Lord, we often say these 66 love letters that you've given to us. Lord, that as we open them up, we hear you speaking to us, expressing your love, Lord, and then seeing how you moved, Lord, in the life of imperfect people. Um, Lord, gives us hope, Lord, uh, that you can use us in a special way, Lord, to bring you honor and to bring you glory. Simply ask you now, look in upon those who we lifted up before, uh, before your throne this evening, Lord, just have mercy on them, give them comfort, give them strength. Uh, those who have lost loved ones, just please, Lord, comfort them like only you can. Um, send peace to their homes, to their families, and most of all, reveal yourself to them in a way to know, let them know, Lord, that by trusting in you, Lord, they can make it through these challenging times. Bless our time together tonight to the glorifying of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> my, uh, my engineer over here is giving me uh, instruction. Uh, let me say good evening to Pastor Frazier. He says, Greeting, greetings, Pastor Max, Sister Betty, and the Embassy family. Uh, Sister Angel has come on. Um, I, I was reminded today about the spring, uh, the spring classes over at uh, Corinthian uh, Baptist Church next next week. I think they're starting Monday. Okay, mm -hmm. and so um, I know I got a I got an email a couple of days ago from uh, Minister Smith, and so you can. I'm just kind of doing this on the fly. I had not talked to him, but you can go online. Uh, if you want the link, you probably let me know, and I can shoot you the link. What you can do is you go online, and then you can register. Uh, but the spring school starts next Monday. It goes from Monday, Monday through Friday, and that is from six to eight. And so when you start going in to log in uh, or to register, it has a drop down for the classes. And so you can click the drop down and see what kind of courses are there, what kind of courses are available. OK, and so I believe that is uh, I asked Mario as well. I believe that we are uh, we can go and take those classes if you wish. And so if you if you have any other questions, you can you can call me or text me or uh, you can contact Minister Smith as well. OK, so Glenn Smith says good evening. Uh, let's see. Anybody else I missed? OK, all right. We're going to get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We say hello to all people on Facebook. Maybe there's some that did not type in anything. We say good evening to everybody on Facebook. Uh, did I speak to Tony? Hey, Tony Irby. I'm sorry if I did not. All right, I'm going to share my screen and we'll uh, pull up the PowerPoint just so you have something to look at. Ha uh ha. -huh. Okay. So I'm going to just, uh, let's see. Is it bad? Yeah. Oh, okay. My wife was saying, oh, I'm like, uh oh, what's wrong? Okay. So let me. Put a couple of them in here. So we're in the book of Judges. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to uh, one of our characters that we had begun to talk about, and that is Gideon. But just for a quick refresher, as we look at the theme of the book of Judges, uh, we we discovered with these two verses, uh, chapter 17, verse six, and chapter 21, verse 25. And for those that maybe this is your first time joining us, we're doing. Uh, study on on bibliology or just studying doing an overview of the books of the Bible. So just kind of flying over, just looking at uh, some of the things that stand out to us in each of the books. And so now we're in the books of history, and Judges is one of those books. Um, in those chapters, chapter seventeen and six, and and chapter twenty one and twenty five, it talks about how the Israelite people did what was right in their own eyes. And that's pretty much what got them into, into trouble. Uh, they had gone away from the standard of God, but then when they would get themselves in trouble, they would cry out to God again. And then God would raise up a judge and give them instruction on what to do. And then, of course, God would deliver them. And then after they experienced some of the, the freedom and 
and the, what God has done for them, after a while, they would begin to fall back into sin or fall back into being disobedient. And then God would have to discipline them by raising up another nation, mm -hmm. um, you know, to judge them. And so um, this book, one of the things is that's, you know, when, when we tend to, we talked about it a bit last week, when we tend to think to ourselves what we feel is right in our own eyes beyond the word of God, you, you'll find yourself in trouble. In that last sentence, we have chaos is inevitable when we live life by our own approach or when we live life by our own standards. Mm -hmm. So God has given us his word uh, so that you and I can, our, every area of our life can be governed by his word so that we can live within those standards mm -hmm. and we can experience the fruit of those things. Mm -hmm. And so the part that I wanted to uh, come back on is, is I wanted to go back to Gideon and uh, I want to kind of walk through Gideon a little bit. I didn't feel like I did well on that. So tonight we'll, um, we're going to, we're going to look at just two judges tonight, Gideon, and then we're going to look at Samson and there are many more, but I just, those are two, that kind of stand out uh, for me. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Judges uh, and we're gonna start at chapter six. All right, chapter six. So bear with me because I got papers all in front of me and books, Bibles and all this kind of stuff, study Bibles in front of me. So again, just to, to, to kind of refresh your memory, uh, chapter six, verse one, when they would get in trouble, is it they would it would always seem to start out this way. Then the children of Israel did did evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, and then as a result, in this case with Midian, it says so. I'm sorry, with uh, Gideon, it says so. The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens. The, the the caves, excuse me, and the strongholds which are which are in the mountains. So because of the oppression of the Midianite people, it forced the Israelites to have to live really to kind of cower and to go hide uh, when it came time to for harvest uh, and and things like that. And so uh, verse three says, so it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. Uh, also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them and then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the, of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox uh, nor donkey. So therefore they wouldn't just come and get, you know, the grain and things like that, but they would come and get their animals, you know, get the, get the, get the sustenance, get their food. And so every time when it was time for harvest, you know, they knew when to come in there and get get they get their food, you know, and, and kind of just raid all of what they of what they had. Uh, verse four, then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth. As far as oh, I read that then. Verse five, mm -hmm. for they would come up with their livestock in their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Man, so they was. I mean, God was God let them have it. You know, they they disobey God. They turn and begin to do evil. And then guess what? He just sent judgment on them. So here it is. He said they were as numerous as locusts. He says, but they and their camels were without number. That's how big the Midianite army is. Okay. And then they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Okay. Good evening, Tracy Moore. Glad you could join in with us. All right. So so in this point, when they are pressed as far as they can go, it's when they finally cry out to the Lord. And so let me jump down to verse 11. Uh, now the angel of the Lord came and he sat under the tree bent tree, bent tree uh, which was also at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, uh, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it. So we talked about that last week where he was threshing wheat was not the normal place to be threshing wheat. Mm -hmm. Gideon was hiding. Mm -hmm. So he was in the high, uh, in the wine press uh, to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and he said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man, man of valor. Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And we kind of sat on that for a little while. You know, sometimes when we're going through those tough moments in life, 
And we say, the Lord is with you. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. Sometimes it seems like you're all by yourself, okay? Mm -hmm. But be assured, you know, be assured God is still with you. So he goes on to tell, tell Gideon, he says, and where are his miracles? Gideon, well, Gideon asked, I'm sorry, which our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and he said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the, from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? He asked them that question. Have I not sent you? And so the point, one of the things is, as we look at these two for tonight, uh, just be mindful, you know, that God has a plan for your life. Mm -hmm. God has a plan. For, God had a plan for Gideon's life. Yeah. And we're going to look at Samson. God had a plan for Samson's life. Even though Gideon was down there hiding in the wine, wine press, he was, a little bit, he was shy maybe or fearful or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yet, you know, he spoke up, you know, he spoke up to the angel and he said, hey, you know, if he's with us, why are we going through all this stuff? You know, he wasn't too scared. He wasn't too scared. So nevertheless, you know, he did speak up. But let's go to verse 15. So he said to him, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Now, you know, Gideon's got the call, but now Gideon is beginning to question, uh, you know, what he's saying. How, how can the Lord use me? How can, the, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Mm -hmm. You know, have you ever, you know, thought about, you know, can the Lord use me or felt inadequate? Let me say it that, that way. You know, maybe you have felt inadequate uh, thinking that the Lord can't use you. And and here, I mean, when we see these characters in the Bible, we ought to be able to uh, have have some confidence, not in ourselves, mm -hmm. but the idea that if God calls you or has put a burden on your heart to do something, that even though you feel, you know, inadequate, you know, God will equip you to do whatever it is that he has called you to do. And so, you know, Gideon is saying, you know, why me? You know, kind of thing. I'm from the small, I'm from the small tribe. I'm just, you know, from the other side of the tracks. So, you know, why do you want to use me? But here it is. God will use those folk who's, who uh, especially are people that are hum or humble, people that have a sense of humility. You know, he's not looking always for the strong person. He's not looking always for the well-versed person. He's not looking you know, for the person that, you know, got it all together. Sometimes God wants to use folk like you and me. Okay. Okay. Sometimes folk, sometimes God just won't use folk like me. Okay. That maybe feel a sense of inadequacy sometimes, or as we're moving through, because it's at that point, you know, that God comes, he steps in because if he's got a purpose and a plan for your life, then guess what? Hey, he's going to give you everything that you need mm -hmm. so that you can do it, you know? And so every time I stand up, in the pulpit, even after all of these years, there's no sense of confidence, you know, to, you know, get up there all arrogant and be talking, about, okay, let me go and get this, get down with this thing. No, man, it's, you know, every time I come up there, it's feeling like, okay, Lord, do I have this together? Is this is what you, this, what you told me? But now I'm always have to remind myself, but if he has called you, God's going to give you everything you need mm -hmm. to fulfill his purpose for your life. Okay. And so here it is, Gideon kind of, you know, gives little excuses and things like that. Um, and he says, he says, surely, he says, I'll be with you, verse 16, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And verse 17, then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talked with me. And, you know, he says, do not depart from here. He said, I pray until I come to you, bring out my offering. And so then the next few verses, he goes and he begins to prepare uh, the offering and things like that. So you can hear the, you know, he's a little bit timid. You know, we see later down in verse 36, which is where we're getting ready to go, where he begins to, he says, if you're with me, you know, he begins to lay out the fleece. Okay. And he does the test. And so uh, verse 36, so Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, he says, look, I shall put out a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if there's dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, verse 38. And it was so. So God did it. All right. He didn't get mad at him. He said, oh, you little, he didn't say, oh, you have little faith. But nevertheless, you know, he, he fulfilled that. He, then he says, when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Verse 39, then Gideon said to God, 
do not be angry with me. Here it is. He's, he still wasn't, he wasn't assured. He says, do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleas. Let it now be dry only on the fleas, but on all the ground let there be dew. Verse 40, and God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleas only, but there was dew on the ground. So even in the midst of that, you know, God revealed himself to him, even though, you know, uh, Gideon felt limited, you know, he would start to list his limitations, you know, kind of like Moses, you know, I can't talk, you know, I, st I, can I stutter and all of that kind of stuff. You know, he, God didn't, didn't accept him excuses. Mm -hmm. Even when he comes where he's a little bit shy about, you know, okay, if you're with me, you know, do it this way. If you're with me, I don't be angry, but if you're with me, prove it to me again. You know, God doesn't get upset with him. God mm -hmm. shows him that to help build him up so he can, so he can fulfill the plan that he has for his life, man. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think, you know, we need to, as we get ready to look at, at our ministry fair, and then those that have taken the spiritual gift assessment, you know, and if you see what areas that, you know, are, you, you know, your area, then guess what? And you might feel a little funny about it. Mm -hmm. Then, okay, your, you know, give your inadequacy to God and allow him to equip you and to use you mm -hmm. in that area. If God has given you a passion for the work then trust that God will give you everything you need. And listen, it starts with a spirit of humility. Okay, it starts with a spirit of humility. And so, because remember, the gift is not yours. The gift has been given to you by God so that you might use it to help build up the body of Christ. Yeah. But here Gideon, you know, in all of his questioning and all of his, his sense of shyness, uh, you know, he struggles through that, but yet and still, you know, God, God still wants to use him. God still wants to use him. In my call, I sensed God was calling me to preach. Um, and I remember getting scared and getting, you know, a little anxious and fearful about it. And, and I just, and I did not, I didn't respond. And it was a few years that I had, that had gone by, you know, before I actually acknowledged the call. Now I thought, since I didn't acknowledge it when I felt God was calling me, that God took his call away. But that's not so. The Bible tells us that his call is, with, is without repentance. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, is that if you know God is calling you, you can run. And it's cliche. You can run, but you cannot hide. And if God wants to use you, you know, you can bury your head in the ground or bury your head in the sand. But if God is wanting to use you, he's going to continue to come after you in a good way. He's not going to, you know, you know, torture you, but he'll come after you in a good way to, to soften your heart so that you'll surrender to his will. Because listen, let me tell you, as we said, I think it was last week, you know, uh, uh, disobedience is, is not obedience at all or partial obedience. That's what we said. Partial obedience is no obedience at all. OK. And so God wants all of us. God wants wants you to fully surrender your life to him. So now let's just keep on reading, okay? I know it's a lot of reading, but this, I just wanted to point this out as we look at the life of Gideon. Yeah, a couple of chats. In okay, what what we got? Read. Marks. <laughs> Marks. <laughs> My wife said we got some chance to read. Who? He enables the call, Marcia. Okay, Marcia says he enables the call. Mm -hmm. It's it's not negotiable. Okay, Ooh, Marcia said it. it's not negotiable. Okay, Sister Marcia said, he enables the he enables the call mm -hmm. and it's not negotiable. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. All right. Gideon didn't have a choice, I guess, right? Okay. All right. So then in chapter seven, he goes on and it says, let's see, Angela husband, Angela husband is watching with us. She says, Good evening, family. All right. Chapter seven, verse one. Then Jerubabel, and this is Gideon now. Name is his name has been changed. Then Jerubabel, that is Gideon. And all of the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of, of Herod, so, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them uh, by the hill of Mor in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who, now here, this is a trip right here. The people who are with you are too many for, excuse me, let me back up. The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. In other words, he said, you got too many people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he goes on and he says, uh, well, I keep losing my spot. He says, let Israel claim glory for itself 
against me, saying, My own hand have, has saved has saved me. Now therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. Now, I mean, you, you know, in my head, you think, okay, 22,000, that's a lot. But if I still got 10,000, uh, I might still be all right, you know. And so now, but he goes on, uh, verse four, he says, but the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you for I will test them for you there. Uh, then it will be that uh, that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you and the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you. The same shall not go. And so he brought the people down to the water. The Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you will set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink uh, and the number of them who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. Mm. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. And then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300, all right, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his uh, to his place. And so the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands. And he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. All right, stop right there. Okay. And so now God comes and tells him, he said, you got too many people. And then he said, what you need to do is begin to, you know, sift some of them out. And so he says, those that, that will get water and lap it with their hands, keep them. Those that will get down on their knees, you know, let them go on back home. And I don't know the, the, if if there's any any um, sense, not sense, but uh, what I think it is, is that the idea that when you get down on your knees to drink water, you can't keep your eyes up to be aware of the enemy or when the enemy is coming. And so, number one, your posture is bad because you're on your knees. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing is your perspective is bad because you got your head down in the trough trying to drink water. OK, I'm just assuming in that. But then those that would grab with their hands mm -hmm. and then you got, got a little water, you can sip your water. But then you kind of keep your eyes up so you can be aware of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying them folk that want to get down on their knees and get be all comfortable and get down and get some water. He said them folk ain't good. They ain't no good for you, Gideon. So let them go on back home if they want to go on back home. But I need some folk that's going to be ready for the battle. Mm -hmm. I, I need some folk that as they're drinking, as they're replenishing themselves, mm -hmm. they are still ready. They're still preparing themselves for the battle. Mm -hmm. Listen, I ain't trying to compare it to where we are today, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people that might be comfortable. They, but there are a lot of Christians that may be comfortable mm -hmm. getting down on their knees, putting their head down, getting down in that water because they're tired. They're weird. But then guess what? Listen, if we're going to be fighting the Lord's battle, we got to be ready and we got to be lapping. We got to have our eyes, you know, up and around and be looking and have our head on a swivel and be ready to be useful to God. Now, the other thing is, the other thing that this this uh, shows is that when God wants to use us, yeah. we've got to get rid of self-sufficiency. OK, self-sufficiency says with them, all the, the 30,000, how many ever they had, 22 and 10, 32, you know, how many ever they had, you know, that's self-sufficient. That's the idea to say, oh, yeah, we can do this, mm -hmm. especially if they were outnumbered. But the Midianites were many, okay? They were many. Mm -hmm. And so and I don't think Israel uh, outnumbered them, but even, even more when, when God drops it down to 300, mm -hmm. Now you now self-sufficiency is all the way out of the door. Yeah. And now dependency upon God is all the way in the picture. Yeah. And see, what I'm saying is, is that when God wants to use us, he does not want to use us just merely based upon our ability and our skills that we have. Yeah. But God wants to get our self-sufficiency out of the way so that we can put total dependency upon him. And then guess what? You and I can go out with 300 people and do exactly what he's called us to do. Oh, preach, Pastor McNeil. And so, I mean, I see that so plain. And so therefore, when you get 
and you start to have a feeling of inadequacy in your ministry or as you're serving or as you're doing, you know, whatever it is, you know, make sure that you put your self-sufficiency aside mm -hmm. because I think sometimes we've got, we are too self-sufficient. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm not, you know, don't get me wrong. Yeah. We got to think things through. We got to process stuff, but then there's the area where we've got to be totally dependent on God yeah. that if he said, Hey, get rid of all of that. And then I just want you to go with the 300 people. Mm -hmm. Then guess what? Trust me in the midst of yeah. it. And that's the key word right there. When we're serving God, and as we look at this book of Judges, I'm spending way too much time in it as we spoke, as we do this oh, this flyover. You know, we we sometimes tend to always have to have it all the way lined out mm -hmm. before we trust God in the midst of things. Again, not nothing wrong with being prudent, but when God says go, guess what? You got to go with the three hundred. And, you know, we could have sat there and said, no, nah, I ain't going, man, I only got 300 people. I ain't going up there to fight them midnight mm -hmm. people. You know, that ain't good common sense. Well, yeah, it's faith and this trust in the true and living God. Because remember, remember, they cried out to him. Mm -hmm. They had cried out to him. So, okay. So we stop. Let's see. Let me, re let me go to verse nine. So then it says it happened. I want you to hear the story. Because here, here too, even after he tells them, okay, go with 300 people. You know, he he tell, he says it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, "Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered you into, uh, I have delivered it into your hands. But if you are afraid, see that verse ten. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp uh, with poor your servant, and you shall hear what they say. So now he said, you know what? I'm giving them to you. He said, but if you're scared, you know, if you're afraid then guess what? I'm going to show you something. I'm going to let you know that, that I'm with you. God continues to assure him that he's in the right place. And there are times you're going through, man, you're being faithful in ministry, you're being faithful in serving, and then, you know, things are happening and it don't look like it's going to add up. And then sometimes you might question, you know, what God is doing, but it's at that moment, you know, where he says, hey, you're a little afraid? Let me show you a little something, you know? And so here it is, verse 10, he says, but if you're afraid, to go down, go down to the camp of uh, poor, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down to poor his servant to the outpost of the arm, uh, outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Malachites and all the people of the east, they were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. <laughs> and that's something. Mm -hmm. He says, and their camels were without number. Mm -hmm. now, in other words, he said, man, you know, you couldn't even count, you know, mm -hmm. y'all know that. Uh, he said that they were, he said they were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. Mm -hmm. And when Gideon had come there, excuse me, and when Gideon had come, Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream to, uh, to my surprise. He said, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. And it came to a tent and it struck it so that it fell and it overturned and the tent collapsed. He is comparing in this dream, he is comparing Israel, this these 300 people to a barley loaf. Mm -hmm. Barley loaf was the loaf of bread, was the bread for poor people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just the idea that it was nothing but a barley loaf coming down the hill. Mm -hmm. And when it came down the hill, it destroyed the camp. You know, and so, that, so, so in other words, as, you, as we'll read on, mm -hmm. we'll see that God had already put fear inside of the people. Mm -hmm. The battle was already won for Gideon. Mm -hmm. Verse 14, then his companion answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And it was, and, and so it was said when Gideon heard the excuse me, Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation. Listen to this: that he worshipped. Isn't that something? <laughs> Isn't that something? He he worshipped even when he when he knew they were going to win the battle. I mean, when he knew that because as we read on, we'll see that they had fear inside of them. When he knew that, 
He didn't just say, okay, come on, y'all, let's go get them so that we can get this over with. He worshiped. Yeah. It, man, that's, that blows my mind, man, mm -hmm. because oftentimes we're just trying to get through the battle yeah. to get to the victory. Yeah. But sometimes if we just stop when God reveals stuff to us mm -hmm. as we're going along the way, and then when God opens up to let us see something, and before we move forward, just stop and worship him. Yeah. Just stop and say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you already. I God, I thank you for what you're gonna do, Lord. And you know, and he just stops to worship me. It reminds me of Job. When Job lost everything, man, he came to that point and it said, and Job worshiped. God, you know, you might say, well, he had nothing else, but nevertheless, instead of him, you know, complaining and crying and, and things like that, he worshiped God. And there's something about a person who is able to worship God in the midst of opposition, in the midst of all kinds of hell that's breaking loose, in the midst of when you've got a, a Midianite army and you only got 300 men. But listen, 300 men and God is a force, man. And so you, all of us in here, you know, we have God on our side. And so when we're ministering, when we're serving God, when the, when the opposition, the enemy comes in and tries to sow seeds of discord to discourage us and to distract us, Man, understand, listen, that the battle has already been won. Mm -hmm. They used to sing a song at uh, Peace Baptist one time. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait. I, mean, I know these words is all jacked up, but don't wait till the battle is over to shout. Okay, you can shout right now, man. And so even though, you know, might be cancer in your body, mm -hmm. shout right now. Even though death is at your door, mm -hmm. shout right now. Even though the money looks bad, shout right now. You done got your taxes done yeah. and you owe Sam again, shout right now. Amen. You are yeah. All of a sudden, you lost your job. Shout right now. Worship God right now, man. Because guess what? God is going to give you the victory. It may not turn out exactly the way you like yeah. it, but God will give you this sense of victory. And so here it is, man. He, he, he shows him this. He lets them come over and peep in and then listen. You know, and they guys say, I had a dream, man. Barley Low come down the hill and just destroyed all these tents. Yeah. You know, and so and and he and Gideon knows that's us. That's us. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me go back to verse 15 again. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshiped, he returned to the camp of Israel and he said, arise for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. He's telling, no, we got this. Mm -hmm. And that's a leader right there. That's a leader. There's times when leaders uh, can, let, let's see, how can I say this? There's times when the followers may not be able to see what the leader is able to see, okay? And so here, God reveals something to the leader, Gideon, and as he reveals it to them, Gideon has enough confidence to come back and says, hey, the Lord has delivered them into our hands. Let's go, okay? And so I don't see in this text where they start him hauling around, but let me see and make sure I didn't I didn't miss nothing, okay? Um, okay, he says he returned to the camp of Israel and he said, arise for the Lord has delivered uh, the mm -hmm. camp of Midian into your hand. Mm -hmm. Verse 16, then he divided 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, verse 17, look at me and do likewise. Watch when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. Mm -hmm. says, when I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, um, all who are with me, then you also blow, blow the trumpet and on every side, the whole camp and say the sword of the Lord uh, and of Gideon. And so I won't, you know, read anymore. I think that's that's it. Uh, while well, I read 19 and 21, but we see, you know, now he's he gives him the plan, gives them the plan how to go out, to have the sword. They've got the uh, got their trumpets um, and so forth. Verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. He says, and they blew the trumpets and they broke the pictures. And uh, he says that that were in their hands, excuse me, verse 20. Then the three companies blew the trumpets, broke the pictures. They held the torches in their hands and the trumpets in their in the right hands for blowing. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Verse 21. And every man stood in his place all around the camp mm -hmm. and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here it is. You know, he gives them the victory. You know, he gives them the victory. They hardly, they hardly had to fight. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, the victory was given, was given to them. So you can read the rest of that later. 
but I just wanted you to show how God uses um, uses Gideon. Um, you know, maybe if you got life application or you can, you got a Bible dictionary and go and look up Gideon, just see what it says, you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But he, he's not, you know, not the strong willed leader, you know, that we might look for and look at and things of that nature. But God is, God was willing to use Gideon at that moment that they found themselves in captivity or in bondage. And uh, and he used them to deliver them from the from the Midianites. Mm -hmm. All right. Any more chats, Betty? No. No more chat. No. Not on your end. Okay. All right. Now I, I mess up my screen if I do anything. Okay. Go to chapter thirteen. Now we're gonna look at the story of Samson. Story of Samson. Man, this is one of my favorite favorite judges as well. So let's go to Samson. Start chapter 13, verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So now, again, remember we said, uh, I think it's that first page where we talked about the book has some cycles where they would roll, they fall into evil, into bondage, God would deliver. And so here they are again. And so now, Talks about the birth of Samson, but again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren, and you have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to, to God from the womb and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of, uh, out of the hand of the Philistines. And so I wanted to read that so you could see exactly where his, you know, where the beginning of Samuel, uh, Samson, excuse me, comes in, it come, comes in. And so again, here's another one that's going to be right. Another judge is going to be raised up to deliver them uh, from the Philistines. Okay. Let's see. Let's jump down to uh, or over uh, to verse 24. So the woman bore a son. Well, let me back up because I want to emphasize when he told her, he says, be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, not to eat anything for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And hear, the, hear this, no razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite to God. Okay, that's that's the key statement right there. Okay, he's gonna be a Nazarite to God from the womb. So then back to ver uh, yeah, chapter 13, verse 24. So the woman bore a son called his name Samson. The child grew, the Lord blessed him, and the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him in Maniah Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. Okay, now let's keep on. Chapter 14, now Samson went down to Timnah. Uh, he saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. And so he went up and he told his father and his mother saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Mm -hmm. So he saw him, he saw him somebody mm -hmm. and say, she must've been somebody. He said, go get her. Mm -hmm. He said, go get her. I've seen her, go get her. Now look at what his parents say. Verse three, then his father and his mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? <laughs> so another one said, ain't that, you know, ain't no, ain't that, you can't find nobody else. Y'all didn't get that. Okay. He said, and said, you know, when your kids bring home somebody, all right. Okay. Never mind. All right. That's just something I thought was funny. And Samson said to his father, he said, get her for me. See, he didn't care. Mm -hmm. Remember, he's got a Nazarite vow. Mm -hmm. He's got a Nazarite vow. Uh, some of that was, he was to uh, not, not cut his hair. Uh, one was thought that he was not to touch any, uh, anything that was dead, any corpse. Um, and then the other thing was he was not to marry, you know, a woman of, of the of Philistines or mm -hmm. anyone, you know, outside of that. And so, um, so 
that's why when he's he's asking for her, she's a Philistine and she's asking for uh, he's asking for her. That's why, you know, the parents are saying, yeah, you know, can't you find somebody else? You know, that's these are not the people that, you know, we're supposed to, you know, we're, we're not supposed to marry these folk. OK, and I'm just following in the text. OK, that don't have nothing to do with today. OK, that's a whole nother topic. But he says, Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. The emphasis was that he was they were to marry someone that was not going to pull them away from them serving the true and living God. Mm -hmm. The tendency would be if he married a Philistine mm -hmm. was the idea that if he married her, then he would fall into the same ways, the same uh, moral things, same type of things that the Philistines did. And the Philistines were the enemies of the people of Israel. OK, so it had nothing to do with race. Let me, I want to say that. So now he goes on verse four, he says, but his father and his mother did not know. Hear this. That, he, that they did not know that it was the Lord, it was of the Lord, mm -hmm. that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Mm -hmm. Remember what we just saw mm -hmm. back in verse, uh, verse five? He said, you know, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the prophesy, prophecy comes in a sense that, hey, you're going to have a son and he's going to be one that's going to move his move the hand against the Philistines, the people that, you know, you are in bondage to. So even as they were asking, they said, hey, can't you find somebody else? They didn't realize what God was really doing. Man, and sometimes it, it can become a mystery for us when God is moving in our lives, when God is mm -hmm. working in our lives. Sometimes everything don't ain't, may not always add up, you know, and so even in this case, you know, as it says, he says, uh, you know, they didn't know that he was seeking an occasion, God was seeking an occasion to set Samson up to be in the right place so he could deal, so he could fight against the Philistines. Okay. And I'm going to try to finish this one. This will be the only one I get to today. So next week we'll start Ruth. Okay. Um, so, okay. So let's go on. Let's see. Verse five. Let's see. Make sure I'm in the right place. No, verse, uh, no verse. Let's jump to chapter 16. Okay, chapter 16, my bad. So now, and you can read that. There's some stuff in there. He, um, gosh, man, Sam Samson, uh, he runs into, let me just say it this way. He, he runs across, I think it's a lion or something, kills the lion rather. And, and then, you know, he goes on his way. Then, but then as he comes back, he notices that there's honey in there, you know, um, kind of thing. And so uh, he dips his hand in the honey and, you know, partakes of it and takes it home to his parents. And the idea of that was some commentators said that he had defiled himself by touching a dead carcass. Okay. And so now he's married, he's married a Philistine woman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Check number one. Mm -hmm. He's touched a dead carcass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Check number two. He's just, he is just of no use. Okay. Mm -hmm. According to the Nazarite vow. All right. I want you to see that. Chapter 16. Uh, let's see. Start at verse four. Afterward, it happened that he loved the woman in the Valley of Sword. So he's no longer with the, with the, the, the Philistine woman. Okay. You have to read that and see what happened. So now it says, after that, it happened that he loved a, a woman in the Valley of Sword whose name was Delilah. This is probably where we are more familiar with Samson and Delilah. Mm -hmm. All right. Verse uh, five, it says, and the Lord's Philistines came up to her and they said to her, entice him and find, find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will, uh, will give you 1100 pieces of silver. So mm -hmm. she is paid to find out what his weakness is. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, she begins to go on her, you know, her track to do that. So I'm not going to read all of it from verses six down to verse 14. She tries ways to ask Sam, where's, you know, where's your strength lie? And so Sam lied to her, you know, and he said, no, come this, that, and the other. And so he kept on kind of putting her off. Now go down to verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me with those, these three times. <laughs> reason why I'm saying that because you have to read between those lines between uh six and down to 14. I, I don't have time. I want to close out the story. And so, but it just sounds like when she gets to 15, how can you say, I love you. I love you when your heart is not with me. You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. 
And then it says, verse 16, it came to pass when she pestered him <laughs> daily. Now, listen, the NIV said, the NIV uses the nag word, okay? When she's nag, yeah, the NIV uses that. But he says, we, she, they, she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. That, okay, I'm not laughing, but verse 17, that he, and here it is, that he told her all his heart told her all his heart and he said to her no razor has ever come upon my head for i have been a nazarite to god from my mother's womb mm -hmm. if i am shaven then my strength will leave me and i shall become weak and like any other man okay mm -hmm. and so it goes on let's go to verse 20 when delilah saw that he had told her all his heart she sent and she called for the lords of the philistines saying come come up once more for he has told me all all his heart so the lords of the of the Philistines came up to her and they brought the money in her in their hand. And then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. And then she began to torment him, torment him and his strength left him. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just read the story. Uh, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep. Now, let me back up. So now. The, the third part of the Nazarite vow, his hair is gone, okay? So remember, he marries the Philistine woman, check, okay? He touches the um, the uh, the dead carcass and he defiles himself, check. And so now he's not to shave his head, he shaves his head, check. You know, no, what use, okay? So now, but in verse 20, uh, verse 20 again, he says, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and he said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Wow. Man, that's a sad place to be. I got to hurry up. That, uh, 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 that's, I was reading it. Yes, yeah, Sister Patrice, we got you. All right. I'm sorry about that. Y'all just trying to, you know, look at the message, but, but look, he didn't even know that his power was gone. Man, that is a sad place to be mm -hmm. that when you have, disobeyed God so much so that you don't even know that the power is gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me finish because I've only got six minutes. So now, but look at what happens. Verse 21 says, then the Philistines took him and they put out his eyes and they brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. And so now they got him. He has no power when they call his name jumps up, he's got no power. So now they are able to subdue him. They are able to get in. They, they gouge out his eyes. They do all this stuff. But then look at verse 22, man. Here's where grace comes into the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> King James says, however, the hair of his head began to grow again mm -hmm. after it had been shaven. <laughs> okay, that maybe that's just me. That's just me. But it said, it says, how, however, all that he went through, defiling himself, all that he went, cutting his hair, all that he went through. But however, the hair on his head started to grow back mm -hmm. because if his strength was in the hair, then guess what? God had not left him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Oh, man. If that's not the grace of God, man, yeah. I don't know what is. Yeah. But listen, man, that 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 is excite that excites me right there. Mm -hmm. That God would give him the grace that his hair would begin to grow back. So let's just get to the end of the story. Mm -hmm. So let me jump. Let's see to uh, verse twenty-five. He says, "So it happened." Now, what has happened is he's in prison. He's still looking bad. His hair's growing back. You know, he can't see his eyes are all gouged out and everything. So what they do is they're drinking in the, you know, court in the Coliseum and stuff, and they're making sport of him. They bring him out. Let's have some fun. Let's have some entertainment. Bring out Samson. And so they bring him out. Verse 25. So it happened when their hearts were merry. They said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the two pillars. And then verse 26, and then Samson said to the lad who held, him, who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, uh, uh, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Mm -hmm. Now look at this, verse 28. Then Samson called to the Lord. In other words, Samson prayed. Yeah. Samson called to the Lord saying, oh Lord, First of all, he says, remember me, mm -hmm. I pray. 
And then he says, strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Now, let me go back to those two, the, his request. He says, he called out to them to remember me, to remember, he says, Lord, not them, but to, to God, to remember him in the midst of it. Some said this might've been a word of repentance, but it's, it was some, uh, some even talked about, it was a word that may have said, recall Lord, why you put me on the face of this earth to do what you called me to do. In other words, I mean, it's not all in the word to me, but you can see it, man. If he is repenting, yeah. he may have said, you know what, Lord, I was called to, to deliver us from the Philistine people. Lord, if you would recall that call on my life, remember what you have called me to do. And then when he goes to the place of strengthening, strengthening me, he, now he's saying, okay, Lord, now strengthen me with, to the calling which you have called me to do. In other words, to destroy the Philistine people. Yeah. And so he's crying out to God in the midst of this. And he says, help me to do it with one blow. But he's, mm -hmm. he's a brilliant man because he asks, he asked the lad yeah. to stand in between the columns. I got yeah. two minutes. Yeah. He asked the lad to stand in between the two columns. Yeah. So verse 29 says, and Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people were in it. And so the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And so never, nevertheless, what had happened was even though he gotten off from his purpose, mm -hmm. when he cries out, God, remember me, yeah. God, remember what you called me to do. Mm -hmm. Lord, I repent of what I've done. He says, strengthen me now, Lord, in this moment, this one time, Lord, that I might fulfill your purpose and your mm -hmm. plan for my life. Mm -hmm. And see, the idea of the restoration is not just so Sam can get back right with God. Yeah, that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is so that God's plan mm -hmm. can go through, man. Yeah. And so guess what? Our imperfections, mm -hmm. all of those things... Mm -hmm. Our shortcomings, I'm not saying, you know, wallowing stuff. I, that's not what I'm saying at all. Mm -hmm. But understand this, man, that God's grace is here for us. Yeah. And that if you've done something, you've gone walked away from God. If you've walked away from him, you've been mm -hmm. disobedient to him. Let me tell you something. The hair on your head can grow, start to grow back mm -hmm. again. Listen, the grace of God can bring you favor again. Not because you've done anything, mm -hmm. but because God has a purpose and God has a plan for mm -hmm. you. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. I am out of time. I'm right at seven o'clock. I'm sorry. I, you know, didn't give y'all a chance to say nothing, but uh, listen, maybe next week and then maybe not. It's just tough. Okay. It's tough when we're doing this. Let me close out. Uh, let's see. Brandon Lewis came in. Patrice came in on Facebook, said the phone died on Zoom. So sorry about that. I'm glad you, glad you made it. And uh, Jackie Robeson Woods is with us. I see Steve Rowland has joined in as well. Um, with us. And so I'm going to get ready to back out of here. Uh, let Sister uh, Teresa Shelby have it if they are doing their time with the kids. Okay. All right. So let, let me just back out. With, let me close out with prayer and try to be done by 701. And then uh, we'll be gone. Hey, Brother Hammonds. Good to see you, man. I don't think I did. I speak to y'all. I don't remember speaking to y'all, but good to see y'all. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for our time together. Thank you for the word of God, Lord. Um, God, we get, I get excited trying to explain it, Lord. I just pray, Lord, just uh, as, as we pray, you know, put in our hearts, fasten to our hearts, Lord, the things that are meaningful to us, uh, the things we can grab hold of, Lord, knowing that you're a God of second chances, Lord. And uh, even as we look at imperfect biblical characters, Lord, uh, that, Lord, by your grace, Lord, you bring us back into the fold. Yeah. Uh, Lord, you you use us, dear God, for your glory, not our own. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, we're thankful for that. Help us, Lord, in our times of feeling inadequate yeah. as we seek to serve you, Lord. Help us, Lord, in our times of when we're stumbling, yeah. Lord, in sin and just, Lord, move, help us to move in a way that we live in a victor live the victorious Christian life, mm -hmm. Lord, that has been uh, given to us and gained for us by the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. Yeah. Bless the remainder of our week. Lord, we ask that you will keep us in your care. Bless us this Sunday, Lord, as we celebrate Palm Sunday. And uh, Lord, in all that we do, Lord, we want to give you honor, glory, and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. Bye. Bye.